Hi, welcome to Infinite Leaders Live. I'm Lewis Keynes and our why is simple, to be better educators and to be better humans. We want to support and encourage infinite learning for everybody regardless of their role or rank to be willing to listen and to learn. As ever, I'm joined by Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi, morning, Lewis. Thank you. Really looking forward to diving deeper into understanding how leaders with an infinite mindset translate this across to their teams. Uh, we want to focus on the things you don't get taught at university or on any courses. We want real life lessons from real life people with real life experience. And as ever, we are learning and we're recording live, so there might be a few mistakes as we go. We'd love your feedback. Please get in touch with us. We fully believe what we're doing um, and we really want to know what we're doing well and what we need to improve. You can find us on Instagram and YouTube. Alan and I are also on Twitter and you can also find us at theinfinitelearners.com. So listen, learn, share with your colleagues and friends. Uh, and Alan, let's introduce our guest. Yeah, really looking forward to today's uh, show. Get your pens and papers ready. There's going to be some absolute gems of wisdom coming out of the show today. Uh, Anna Power has recently finished her role as Deputy Head at the Primary School at British School Manila. She was responsible for Key Stage 2 and Whole School ICT. And Anna will be starting her first primary headship at the British International School of Riyadh in the diplomatic quarter in a brand new setup in August. So Anna, welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about your journey, please. Thanks very much, Lewis and Ellen, firstly. Um, my journey, wow. So I'm Australian. Um, I grew up in Australia um, and I went to Melbourne University. And then when I left uni, I took a job, much like Ian Deeth at my um, primary school that I went to. And that was really interesting for me because I worked with teachers that taught me. And I remember um, working with Mrs. Fletcher, my year two teacher. Um, and that was sort of my first, I suppose, um, leadership role in terms of, I was in charge of IT because I had grown up with IT. Um, and so I worked with Mrs. Fletcher and taught her how to make tables and um, things in Word and really enjoyed my time there for two years. Uh, then I moved to the UK. I wanted to travel Europe, moved to the UK and I taught in London. And that was just totally different for me. I taught in Wilsdon, a community that I'd never sort of even heard of and diversity in spades with regards to students. Um, and that was really, really tough, but really rewarding. Um, I stayed in London for six years. And whilst I was at that school, I introduced a BYD program. Um, you had to get lots of funding and things then because of the type of school we were in. So I, I was really broadening sort of my skills in terms of how to get money and get things into schools. I decided that I want to move, wanted to move closer to home. So I actually, after visiting a friend who worked at the British School of Tokyo, I said to my partner, wow, we could, we could do this. You know, we could move overseas and I could teach and you could uh, do whatever. <laughs> and we could, you know, we could really make a go of, uh, of living internationally. I'm at international schools. So I applied for a whole bunch of jobs. Um, I got one at Garden International School in Malaysia. And it was there that I stayed for six years. And I think that's where um, I opened my eyes and broadened my role. I went into a, a sort of a very a specialist role there where I was overseeing ICT um, and integrating. I was a e-learning leader, it was called. So I oversaw the integration of technology into school, but I was also a year leader. Um, and that was quite a big school. It was six form entry. So I got to work with some fantastic leaders there. I got to work with Simon Mann, who we all know. I got to work with Neil Smith, who was the head of the Australian School in Singapore as well. Um, and it was just a, a really great experience. And after six years there, um, I called up Simon, who was at British School Manila by this time. And I said, uh, any jobs going? And he said, yeah, actually there are. So I went over to the British School Manila. I got a job as a class teacher with a whole school responsibility for head of ICT. And Simon took a bit of a risk, I suppose, because although I looked at ICT and done ICT from a teaching and learning point of view, I'd never um, did anything in terms of infrastructure. Um, so the more business side of the role. And I did that for a year and then the deputy head came up and I took that. And yeah, I think I've just been very fortunate in terms of who I've worked with, the mentors I've had and every role that I've been in has developed 
um, to the point where I am now going for my first headship, which is a bit nerve wracking, but exciting all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, talk us a little bit about that, that taking on that new leap of faith. How, how are you feeling about that? Um, I'm excited. I know I can do it, but you know, it's like anything when you, until you get, until you're there on the ground and you're actually in a job. Um, I think there are lots of questions as to what, when, why, how, but I think as long as I'm clear as to my, my why, um, then I think, and well, I don't think, I know <laughs> that, that, that I'll, that I'll be sort of really successful, I suppose, in the role. I don't want to be too, I don't want to over egg myself, but I think, um, you know, I've done the hard yards. I've worked with lots of different people in lots of different contexts. And I think, it's time to just take that next step. But yeah, I wouldn't, I won't say it's not a bit um, nerve wracking if I'm being honest. <laughs> no, we, we certainly appreciate that honesty. T tell us what your why is, Anna. Um, I think my why, I, it's interesting. I was listening to Rebecca speak and she said, you know, in terms of being a teacher and if you don't want to be a teacher, you don't want to do it for the kids um, and you shouldn't be in the job essentially or something to that effect. And essentially when I first went into teaching, I don't think I went into it for the right reasons, to be honest. I think I had done a Bachelor of Arts degree for a year. And then I thought, what am I going to, what sort of my job am I going to get with this degree? So I went into teaching because I knew it was something that I could do. I've always sort of led things. So I knew it was something that I could do. Um, and yeah, but I think over time, it's really, especially having my own children, providing an education and an institution like, we had at British School Manila where we can give children sort of the academics, but the holistic um, side of teaching and learning and really just making them sort of really well-rounded and understanding themselves as much as you can at that age and people around them and just, you know, the world that they're living in and going to go and embrace. I think that's really important in terms of what we do as educators. And I think that's something that I love doing and that I've always sort of done without really even knowing it. I think sometimes you go into positions and you, I just like to get the job done. <laughs> and I, and I, but I enjoy what I do. I'm very passionate about what I do and I'm very energetic and I'm very, you know, I can be very dynamic and go around, rush around, but I really do love um, seeing children develop and grow. So it's, um, it's interesting. It's fun. Yeah. I admire your honesty there when you, you say you didn't actually go into it as a, no. as a passion and it's developed over time. And what would you say there's your core values? And clearly honesty is probably one of those. Yeah, honesty is definitely my one. It gets me into trouble sometimes. I've learned to uh, rein it in a bit, but I think um, honesty definitely is one. Um, I think I'm a very nurturing um, leader in terms of I really take the time to get to know people and mm. really, um, and I think that's really important when you work at any school, but more so in international schools, because you are visiting a country, you are there temporarily, and you've got to respect sort of the people and the country that you're in. And I think it's really important that um, you, you know, you take those opportunities. And I think too, you've got teachers that are, you know, from other countries themselves. So you're taking you become their family. And I think nurturing for me has become a good way of getting to know my staff, getting to, um, you know, just yeah, you know, making them more comfortable with, with how they are, particularly in an international setting, and then um, being able to then get the best out of them for the work that they do. I think being student centered and driven, like I've done a lot of work this year with wellbeing. And I think that that's, and a lot of work with, with, counsellors and you know different parts of the school combining to try and get the best that we can for the students to, to make sure that we're providing them with a well-rounded um, program I suppose to, to help them develop. Having lived in in Australia and, and London and Malaysia and Manila and going to Saudi Arabia what, what are the constants that you see in school with children you know you talked about nurturing as a leader and being really child-centered. What, what are the things that you see consistently with children across the world? You're in a good position to share that kind of information. I think you, you've got to remember that they're just children. <laughs> they're just kids, you know, like, and they want to be loved. They want to have fun and they want to try and find their place. And I think that that happens in all, and, and, as, and that's just not children, that's adults as well. And so I think that that's really important that you, 
try and provide a place that's comfortable enough and safe enough for them to be able to do that. And I think I've been really fortunate to work at establishments that have done that and done it well. Um, tell, tell us a little bit more about the well-being side of things. How, how have you been involved in that and what kind of work have you been doing? Well, um, I was responsible as the deputy head sort of liaising with the councillors. And so I've done a lot of work. Well, we wanted at BSM for counsellors. So we didn't really have much of a counselling program for the primary school. And we developed that pretty much in the five years that I was deputy there. Um, and the counselling team there are absolutely fabulous. But what we wanted to get to, and I think what we got to before, you know, at the end of this year, at least, is moving from a proactive, moving from a reactive to a proactive state. So, for example, this year in the, all the classes in my key stage, the counsellors were going in and we were, we brainstormed as teachers, what are the issues that every, that we have every year in year five? So for us, it was girls <laughs> and their friendships. And so we developed a program, not just for the girls, for the boys as well, for them to be able to recognise, okay, this is something that happens <laughs> at this age. And, you know, we're giving, we were empowering teachers to sort of deal with, um, deal with those issues. And we also were setting the stall out for the children to know, for them to understand that this is what happens, but also giving them tools to be able to cope with that. And I think that's why I love the BSM wellbeing framework or the wellbeing framework as it's now known, given that we're not at BSM anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it provides children with a set of tools and strategies that they can use and, and behaviours that they can recognise and that they can attempt to control or just even understand. So I think that's what I really loved about about my time in terms of developing that um developing it with yourself lewis and rebecca and ellen and you know lots of people um they say it takes a village <laughs> and it definitely does you know to, to raise a child and i think it's really important that that everyone plays their part but i'm really really proud of the the well-being um program that we introduced so this year for example we changed the timetable totally in primary school the first uh, 20 minutes of every day was dedicated well-being time and so we did a whole bunch of things in terms of positive psychology, uh, journaling, you know, savouring, uh, mindfulness, just giving children tools to be able to draw upon. And as a mother too, I'm really grateful because I know, you know, my daughter and my son sometimes draw on those tools and they wouldn't have had them if we hadn't taken the time to, to develop them and to show them how to, how to use them. So I think I've been really privileged to work with that wellbeing team. And that's something I'm definitely going to take on in my next position. And how has that helped you personally, Anna? Are they, has that been something that's had an impact on, on you as well as your children and the children that you teach? Most definitely, yeah. I um, did the Science of Wellbeing course online. And I think since then, um, I've broadened my mind in terms of tools that you can utilise to help, um, just to help give you perspective, I suppose, and to help, you know, you're in a high pressure situation and schools are very fast paced they're very you know they're ever changing and I think having those tools I recently I went on a mindfulness course as well and up until that point I'd thought oh you know mindfulness is not for me I, I exercise I love to exercise so I go for a run and it gets me thinking but for me mindfulness brought something else and it came at a time where I really needed it and I'm forever grateful that I did it at that time um, and it allowed me to to see it in a different way, I suppose, in a different light. And it's something that I, I use now regularly. So I'm, I'm very happy and very fortunate, I think, that I've had um, other people that have used those tools and I wouldn't say forced them upon me, but shown me their, shown me their worth and then had the opportunity to explore them myself. myself. So I think that's really important. Yeah, so Anna and I did a mindfulness-based stress reduction course back in January, wasn't it? Uh, I remember on on the, was it the fifth and final day of that that it was a, an eight hour silence, yeah. and I would never have bet that you could have ever yeah. have done that. <laughs> me, yeah, me either. I was doing it just to prove a point, just to prove to all the people in the room that thought I couldn't do it uh, that I could. <laughs> but I think what, you found it harder than me, Lewis. <laughs> I, I, I did find it difficult without a shadow of a doubt. What, what did you get from that? What were the takeaways that you learned? I, you know, personally, I learned so much about myself and and the kind of triggers and drives that I have to seek social connection. What, what, what did you come away from that course with? I came away with a, I think a sense of 
not needing to rush about everywhere and, you know, always, um, I'm not very comfortable when it comes to silence <laughs> and, you know, I like to fill in the gaps, but I think that that course gave me an appreciation to just maybe stand back a bit and maybe listen a bit better. Um, and just appreciate, I suppose, what's around you rather than just jumping straight in and trying to get things done. I think that's pr probably what I got, got from it the most. And I, I try and enjoy, enjoy things about a bit more without trying to rush on to the next thing, you know, enjoying the moment and just, you know, living in the moment rather than trying to think and rush in your head. Okay. I've got to do that after this. And, you know, I remember actually, you know, when I read my children books at night, sometimes, you know, you're reading them the book, but you're not actually re thinking about the book. I'm thinking about, Oh, what work am I going to do? You know, what do I need to do after I read this book? And all I want to do is get the book read, <laughs> but actually, you know, they're really special times. So I think that course taught me to just, yeah, embrace those moments. The work will still be there after, but just to take a bit more time. And I'm really yeah. grateful for them, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's real eye opener, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, Ryan Campbell, when when you listen to his, his, yeah. his interview, <laughs> he talks about being a magpie, and, and I love that expression. Uh, I'm just interested to hear what's the best bits that you're going to take from your different experiences onto your new role. What I'm going to take, lots of things actually. <laughs> um, working with Simon Mann for me was a real um, eye opener, and I think I'm going to take a lot of the things that he that he does. Um, I love that Simon walks past people and he'll strike up a conversation and, you know, really get to know people. And I think for me, that's, that's the biggest takeaway in terms of getting to know your staff and getting them to understand, you know, your vision and to, and to embrace that vision, I suppose, and to, in, in their own way. And I think that's, that's really important. So it's getting people, you know, getting people to understand where you're really coming from. Um, without shoving it down their throats, but actually getting them to be part of the journey. And I think that's the biggest thing that I'm going to take away. And I think you've got such a brand new school and so it's a fabulous opportunity to do that. Everyone's there, they're keen, they're willing. And so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do that. I'm going to, um, what else? I think the sense of community that I've had at both the schools I've been to have been second to none. And I think trying to create that community and, and really, you know, sort of define that culture. You know, I'm a parent as well. And I think, you know, I want to be around and I want to be visible. So I want to be talking to people at all different times and, you know, spending time around the students, popping my head into classrooms. I don't want to be just in my office having to do administrative stuff that would kill me and bore me to death. I really, I, want, I like to be in the thick of the action. And I think, um, Simon was very much like that. He'd always stick his head in and you'd be like having a meeting and you'd eye roll because you knew that it was going to last a bit longer than, <laughs> than than the intended time that you'd allocated because he'd be asking questions. You boys know that more than anyone. So it's... Um, oh, that doesn't sound like Simon. <laughs> not at all. No. <laughs> so I think, you know, getting, shaping that with staff and with community and making everyone feel like they're valued and on board, I think is going to be my biggest my biggest sort of takeaway. In terms of the challenge then, how, how big a challenge do you think that will be? Oh, I think it'll be a big challenge. But like I said, I think when you're opening a new school, everyone's there because they want to be part of something special and they want to be part of something new. And, and I think, you know, there are need to be things initially that you put in place to make it easier for people to get to grips with all the other things they've got to do. So I have no doubt that it will be challenging, especially in these times of COVID where I'm not even in the country yet. <laughs> um, and we've been doing a lot of prep work to try and get, get to a point where, you know, I'm not pulling my hair out and I'm not stressing so that I feel like things are, you know, are rolling. So I think, yeah, it's definitely going to be challenging, but hopefully I'm going to... Um, presume positive intentions and go with that and sort of setting stalls that is, you know, setting the stall out early and hoping people that just want to be there for the right reasons. Yeah. It's, it's an exciting time. And I'm sure it's one that you'll look back on at, at the moment with there being so much uncertainty to think, you know, you, you did well to get through it and manage it. And I wondered if you could be, be honest with us just for a, a couple of instances and tell us what you're most looking forward to 
what, what's really exciting you about the role and what, what's your biggest anxiety at the moment or, or your, your biggest concern ahead of going over to Saudi? What's really exciting me, but my biggest anxiety probably at the same time okay. <laughs> is having a, the autonomy to be the person that makes that call or whatever, you know, like at BSM, I love Glenn Hardy, <laughs> who's the guy that I work with, but you know, I, I, sometimes I don't, wouldn't say get my own way. We have conversations, but you know, you're, you're not, you don't make that last call. And I think that that's going to be an interesting part of the role and something that I'm really excited about, but then really scared about all at the same time. Yeah. Um, so yeah. tell us that leads in probably nicely to the the next kind of uh, a question that I was considering is what will guide your decision making there? What will be the guiding principles around the the decisions that you make with that autonomy? Yeah, I think you've like you've definitely got to consult people. <laughs> it's not just going to be my. I'm just going to go in there and make a snap decision. You know, you need to you need to gauge other people's opinions and you know have your ear to the ground have other people's ear to the ground for you you know it's um yeah it's not something that i that i'll just go in and and do it's definitely something that i'll do in response to having um listened and learned and understood from the people that are there um and then obviously there's a principal at at um bisr that i can go to helen olds in terms of you know, to ask questions and, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. And I think that that's something that um, is a trait that I've always had. I, if I don't understand something, I'll ask and I'll seek advice and I'll seek opinions. I'll ring, you know, friends or colleagues. I've got a really good network of people around me that I can call on. Um, should I, should I need advice? And I often do. <laughs> I'm a, you know, you're only human. So I think it's important that you've got that network of people around you that you can call upon. So they'll definitely be getting a few texts, I think, uh, <laughs> in the coming months. Um, also, I've got people on the ground. Alan will be there. So if I don't know the answer, I'll just ask Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll do a Ryan Campbell and uh, <laughs> so presume I'm getting it wrong and then have a check-in process. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll text Ryan, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the um just tell us just linking back to that, Anna, really, is it tell us about a really challenging period you've had as a leader and and, and how you then sought a solution for that. That challenging period. I think whenever you're a leader, you know, Rebecca spoke about um and you spoke about this with Joe Lee in terms of passion and having that drive and and you know for, for what you believe in and I think when you get people that don't necessarily align and I'm not talking about passion I'm talking about you know um I, there are people that that I've worked with that like to think things through a lot <laughs> and won't implement anything unless it's tried and tested and and for me that's not really the way that you know, the world or, or educational institutions work, you know. So I think working with people that aren't necessarily, um, I wouldn't say you have to be on board straight away, but that aren't necessarily willing to, to look at change as something that could be positive is something that, um, that I've had to really get my head around as a leader. Um, and there have been quite a few people sort of like that in my career. And then looking at how, as a leader, you you get them to either acknowledge that they're potentially not necessarily right for the role or the school or the, you know, it happens on lots of different levels. It could be a role within a school or a role, you know, or the school itself. So it's, um, yeah, moving people on, I think is something that, that can be difficult, but those conversations need to be had and it needs to, needs to be done. Um, and I think, yeah, I've had a few of those. <laughs> so yeah. How, how do you how do you have those difficult conversations, Anna? What what strategies do you have in place? Yeah, I think keeping conversations child centred. You know, so you're not attacking, or you're not going in there and you know attacking an individual in terms of. But you're being you, you're talking very very matter of factly about you know how this is affecting, for example, the students or the 
the parent or, you know, or whatever the situation may be. So you try and sort of, I try and be, I suppose, non-judgmental and, be, and being really empathetic, I suppose, trying to understand different perspectives in terms of where they're coming from. You know, I always take the time to, to think through before I go in and speak to someone what they must be, might be feeling or their point of view and trying to understand that a bit. Um, but while still remaining focused on what, what it is, what the outcome is that I need to, to achieve. I often oh, practice. How, how important is that to be a two way thing? Them understanding or, or, or even arriving at, at those difficult decisions. Is that something that, that as a, as a leader you see as a leader's responsibility to make or, or is that something that's a, a two-way conversation and, and a collaborative decision on whether the school is the right school or the approach yeah. is the right approach or the initiative is the right initiative, et cetera? I think as much as possible you make it a collaborative decision, you know, because at, at the very heart of whatever it is that you're trying to do as a school is the school's vision and mission and you need to make sure that, I suppose whoever's in that situation is adhering to those, you know, to, to that. So, you know, I think giving people the opportunity to, to see potentially what it is that they're doing that potentially isn't in line with what you're promoting um, and giving them a chance to rectify it is always the way you would want it to go. But there have been times when, you know, that hasn't worked, I suppose. And, you know, and they've made a decision or we've made a decision that, you know, this isn't, this isn't working and, you know, we need, we need closure in some way. <laughs> uh, what, what's the best piece of leadership advice you've been given that, that's helped you through your career? Oh, best piece of leadership advice. If you do, <laughs> if you don't, you don't have to have all the answers. Um, I think that's the best bit of advice that I've learned. And I think, you know, that's, that's really difficult. That was really difficult for me ever since, ever since I was a little girl, you know, I've, I've always been, people called it bossy, but then, it, you know, as I got older, it went into leadership. <laughs> but in terms of, and I think, you know, sometimes as a leader, you think you've got to have all the answers. And I think you definitely don't, you know, you need to, you need to draw on those people around you. And I think that's a lesson that you learn <laughs> quite quickly when you're in an educational institution, because you've got so many people that are diverse and so many um, different perspectives to consider that you can't possibly know everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what are your non-negotiables there then, Anna, in terms of as a leader, mm -hmm. you, you've got your expectations, you've got your non-negotiables. How do you then show them across to your, to your staff? It's oh, a hard question. I think, I think you've just got to try and be as clear and you've got to role model what you do want rather than what you don't want. <laughs> and I think for me, that's, that's what I try and do in terms of, you know, I want to go in and have conversations with people and to build positive relationships and so that they can come to me when, you know, before, before things get to a point where, it's too late or they, you know, they're upset. So I think one, yeah, I don't know. That's, I find that a really difficult question. Um, yeah. I think for me, being honest is a non-negotiable. <laughs> um, just be, I think so often, not just in life, people aren't honest and it makes things so much harder than, than they need to be. You know, if you've got a problem, I would much rather, and I know for some people, this is difficult. It's never been difficult for me, but if I am not happy with something, you know, I will find a way if I can't get over it, I suppose, to, to broach that subject with whoever, you know, is concerned. And so I, I think that that just solves lots of problems in the long run. So I think it's really important that, that people are honest and that they're, that they're trying their hardest and they're for the right reasons. I mean, life sometimes is very, you know, it's so complex and everyone's coming from a different place. And, you know, when you get to work, you've probably already, you know, by that time I've already exercised, given my kids breakfast, you know, had arguments in the car or, you know, and you've just gotten there. So it's just to try and be a bit empathetic, a bit, you know, have a bit of empathy as well for people and where they're coming from. So for people to, not just me, but everyone in, in the working environment to, to be able to do that for each other. So I suppose that's, another another one 
you just mentioned there about having arguments in the car. I mean, <laughs> we're very similar in, in, in the way that we, we deal with our family units. How are you going to juggle being, yeah. being the top guy at school and yeah. having a family unit, two, two young children, a husband, uh, and then living in a new country? How's that going to look? Chaos? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. But, you know, like anything, I think I'm just going to do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you don't, you know, until you're in a situation, you don't, you know, I could think, try and think of all the possible solutions and, you know, you know yourself, you know, you're going into work one day and something's happened, you can't find a hairbrush or whatever. And it, you know, it could ruin, it could ruin your day in terms of where you're going from and, you know, trying to center, you know, so it's just trying to, I think, you know, be as organized as possible in terms of at home. You know, so having routines in place. <laughs> um, but I think you just have to deal with it and you just have to try and just do the best you can. After all, you're all human. It's just trying to find a way to, to work together and just get the job done, really. It's too much faffing about. <laughs> I just need to get it done. <laughs> and, and this would be a good one for the, the families and the working parents that are listening in. Is Your, your kids have been settled at, at VSM for a number of years. They're moving on yeah. to a, a new country and a new school. What strategies are you putting in place to help those children settle in and, 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 and make a good transition into this, this new challenge? Mm -hmm. Well, first I'm going to try a bit of bribery. <laughs> so I said to the kids, <laughs> I, said to the kids uh, I said to the kids that they could get a new room when we moved so they could have a bit more ownership over their, their space because they're, they're, my children are about to turn seven and nine. So they're getting a bit older. So we sold sort of the furniture that they had in Manila and we said, okay, you get to sort of have your own room and your own space and you get to design it. So trying to make things, you know, give them a bit of ownership, I suppose, over, over their new space and what that's going to look like. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, you know, we'll just have the same sort of routines that we have here, just try and keep things consistent. Um, my children are very different. So my son, when we told him we were leaving was like, Oh, that's good. I'll just make new friends. And my daughter wasn't, and my daughter was not like that at all. She was the total opposite and extreme. So, um, yeah, I think we just have to keep talking to them. We have lots of conversations. They were part of the decision in terms of us moving. Um, you know, we give them a lot of ownership over, you know, what the house is going to look like, where we're going to go. And then, yeah, my husband said to my son that he can have a dirt bike. So, you know, there's a bit of bribery and a bit of a uh, conversation all at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know you say all in good humor and, um, and there's a laugh and a joke in there, but, but what, what has parenting helped you to understand better about leadership? Is there a link there that, that's obviously talked about quite a lot? Without a doubt. And we've just had two staff members that um, have had babies in the past you know, couple of months. And I've said to them, now you know why I'm a bit crazy when it comes to my kids, because you just, you just don't know, um, or not that I say you just don't, but for me, I didn't understand, you know, how much, how important children were <laughs> to, to parents until I had my own. And you'd do anything for them, you would, even when they drive you bananas and, you know, but you just, you know, you, and you can't, for me, I, I could never understand that. I thought I knew. I really thought, and I used to get really offended when people would say to me, oh, you don't have children, you don't know. And I'd be like, how dare you? I'm a professional and blah, blah, blah. But I think in terms of, yeah, I, I didn't know, to be honest. I really didn't know. I couldn't, I couldn't, I can't feel for any other child the way I feel for my own children. As much as I try and I love the children that I teach and the families that we meet. And, you know, I've got, had some lovely emails from families, um, you know, and, children having left BSM and, you know, saying that I made a real, you know, just, just really lovely warm emails. And you just think, Oh, you know, that's what, that's what you want for your kids. You know, you want them to be loved by others. And I think that's the most important thing for me. I think I've noticed um, a lot of, I've noticed teachers that perhaps could just have a bit more warmth and a bit more, be a bit more nurturing. And for me, that's, that's really important when I'm recruiting teachers and I have, you know, so that they can make those connections with the children. I think that's really important. That's really something I've emphasised with the teachers that I've, I've led. 
And I think that's, that's really important. Take the time to make those connections because the children will do anything for you. You know, I remember being in a supermarket and seeing my art teacher, Mrs. Young, getting so excited about it. You know, all she had to do was say hello. And that made my day. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Just make, but taking the time to make those connections and to just, just to get to know, to get to know children um, in more of a sort of meaningful way. I think that that would be the biggest um, thing that, that I could tell people. Yeah, so so simple and, and, and so often overlooked that that connection with a a student that can really make their day and, and, and really be a highlight of their week. I think it comes down to as well, like, you know, that link for me with mindfulness there in terms of just or just being mindful in the moment rather than mindfulness. You know, just just um just really living in the moment, I suppose, and take not take you know, not trying to rush on to the next thing, which I think as teachers you're so busy that sometimes you you do because you're always thinking of the next the next task or the next activity. But actually, just being a bit more grounded and just slowing down a bit might actually save some you know a lot of time in the long run. <laughs> I'm I'm interested there. You've done recruitment. Is it the first time you've done recruitment uh, this this year? Uh, I've done. I've done it a little bit in the past, but I'm recruiting sort of the administrative staff at the moment and yeah. the librarian and yeah. And that's really interesting. I find that, I find it really difficult um, because I like to have a chat with everyone and you know, and you're sort of, and on paper, I, I find it difficult because you know, when you, you look through the CVs and I always sort of make the notes and things and you know, on paper you sort of have your, not your favorite, but you think, okay, this person's going to be more qualified. This person looks really good. And then when you talk to people, it could totally, it can totally flip that, that sort of perception. So I think principles of, there, Anna. are you, are you very much down that values line where you think, oh, you know what, that's a, that they're a cracking person, I can work with them, or do you go down that paper line where it's, oh, they've got no. great qualifications, they've worked in great schools. Where, where's your tendency to go there? Oh, definitely values. Okay. Definitely, I think you know, um, you've got to have. I mean, we had someone just yesterday who ticked all the boxes in terms of on paper, but then just I didn't get that warmth from them. I didn't get that, you know, they were, yeah, I just, I just didn't get the warm sort of feeling. They may have been nervous, but it just didn't come across in terms of what they were saying yeah. or how they were acting. And, you know, I suppose it goes back to for me as a parent, that's what I want in an educator. I want someone that's going to be warm and take the time to understand and to have a laugh. Humour, you know, for me, gets me gets me through a lot so I think you know not being so um I suppose I wouldn't say straight but not being so you know um confined to a certain way you know yeah. wanting to laugh a bit wanting to have fun you know I can remember many a, a meeting with Rebecca um and you know we just we just laugh and we were having fun we were really enjoying our jobs and and being part of a team that that just enjoyed being in their jobs as well and I think you know you can't um you can't go past laughter to, to sort of get a team together and and make them do do great things <laughs> no I fully agree and I sort of I think that Scott Barlow talked about he, he he's a principal in in the UK and his son's in the school and we asked him the tough, tough question of as a teacher and as a leader would you want the someone you're recruiting teaching your own kids and, and, and that, oh, it comes down to, do you feel the same? I've been reflected on as a parent there, how important it is of your child. Do you take that into yeah. recruitment as well? Yeah, without a doubt. Who would you want around them? Um, and it's funny, you know, because when you, have, um, <laughs> when you have children in a school and you're in charge of recruiting and, you know, allocating which teachers go to where, you know, parents, most parents assume that, you know, that, that you're going to give your child, you know, the, the cream of the crop or the, the teacher, you know, the, the teacher that, um, that everyone wants, or, you know, the, the teacher that's the best essentially. And so, you know, this, <laughs> it's, it's funny. You often get emails saying, Oh, you know, I want whoever, you know, teacher that, you know, your child's going to be with. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't do, you know, you've got to have a, a broad sort of um, perspective, but you've got to really, you know, you've got to make sure they're all good. You know what I mean? You got to, you got, you don't want to, you know, you want you don't you don't want those emails. You want the te the parents to be able to, you know, be confident in whoever is going to be in that year group, you know, and not rely on where you place your child to, to determine <laughs> who the best teacher is. Yeah, it's a good point actually. He's thinking it from a different perspective there. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, winding it, winding it down a bit, Anna, now we've got our quick fire questions at the end. Um, we always right. look forward to these. We'll start with the book. Which book are you reading at the moment? Okay, at the moment, I've actually got it to show you because um, I've got Principal Voice by Russell Puglia. And the reason I love this book, I've read it, but I've sort of been, I read it previously, but I'm rereading it now. Um, the reason I love this book the most is because of the voice model that they use. He uses a, um, a model that sort of listen, learn and lead and gives lots of examples in terms of how to build that trust and respect in, in your school and, you know, ensuring that it's a, a shared understanding and responsibility. And it gives some really good examples of what not to do and what to do um, when you're leading. You've got books on um, student voice, um, and principal voice and sort of parent voice it considers all aspects of you know the, of the school community. So that's a really good read. Unlike Ryan, I only have one book. Um, <laughs> one I do not have two Kindles two. worth of. <laughs> I was thinking, oh my god, he hasn't changed. But anyway, <laughs> that's it. Two Kindles, Campbell. He'll be known as from now on. And just really thin. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second one, and I'll, I'll let Lewis do the finishing one at the end. Um, you okay. you've just left BSM. Mm -hmm. Going to be starting a, a, a headship and, and going to be in charge for the for the first time. Does leaving a legacy matter to you? Oh. Yeah, I think it does. Um, it does because you invest so much of your time and passion as a leader in in a space. I think it it does. Yeah, it, it, I think it definitely does. I think at BSM you know, my legacy will be looking at the IT and the, and the well-being in terms of the curriculum and they wouldn't be where they are now without that. And although I'm not gloating about it, I think, you know, that's really important. I, you know, it was a better place um, after me being there. <laughs> Some might disagree, but I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I think that's really, that's really important. And that just not, not for anyone else, for me, in terms of satisfaction, I, I can say that I, you know, I tried my best, I worked my hardest and, you know, that that was a positive outcome um, for yeah. others and for myself, you know, because I grew just as much as as the, as the place did, I suppose. Yeah, no, it's the classic all blacks leaving the shirt in a better place. Uh, Lewis, the one to finish? Yeah, go on, Alan's favourite question. Three leaders from history that you'd like to go out for a meal with, Anna? Oh, okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down the female route. <laughs> um, Michelle Obama, I think, you know, if I think about her, I think she was fun. She really strived for, you know, to, to make things inclusive. She was warm and very wise. And I think I really resonate with a lot of the, the things that she um, was pr pr promotes and was promoting, um, but definitely promotes. I think she's I mean, high on the list now, you know. She's got a good few votes, yeah, hasn't she? Yeah, I know. Well, you know, strong girl power. She's up there. She's up there. Um, I, think, I think Jacinta Arden... Um, definitely is high up there for me. I think the way, you know, she's such, even though she's a politician, <laughs> in terms of the way she leads, you know, she's proven that you can, you can have empathy and that you can still be a strong, strong leader. And I think sometimes when you're a woman in particular, that can be considered a, a negative in terms of you're too emotional or you're probably too compassionate or you're too nurturing. And I think she's proven that, um, yeah, that that's, that, that you can still do it and you can do a good job. And yeah. the first one, the last one for me is not um, a, a famous person. Um, I know you said famous or, you know, so, but for, the last one for me is my grandmother um, who passed away recently because um, she was, she had such an interesting life in terms of, you know, came over from Malta to Australia and was uneducated, but just was such a strong woman in terms of, how she raised her family and, you know, she had nine children and she pretty much did it all on her own without speaking a word of English in a country that she didn't know with, you know, and I just think, you know, um, yeah, she was so strong. And if I could, uh, if I could have dinner with her again, that would be amazing. <laughs> wow. She sounds it. Nine children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Incredible. Anna, thanks very much for coming on and giving your time today. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you very much, boys. Yes. Um, guys, search Infinite Leaders Live on YouTube and IGTV. And we're also pleased to announce that we're on all popular podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts and Spotify included. And please remember to visit theinfinitelearners.com if you want to read more 
um, about Alan and I, about articles and webinars and things we've been up to, and also to access uh, links to all our Infinite Leader Live episodes as well. Until next time, we'll see you and please listen, learn and share.